Good evening and welcome to Searching the Scriptures. This will be Judges 12, Part 4, and today's date is February 14th, 2022. I'll go ahead and read from Judges 12, 1 to 7. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and Jehovah delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, Nay, then said they unto him, Say now, Shiboleth. And he said, Siboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. And Jephthah judged Israel six years, Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. In our previous lesson, we had spent some time taking a closer look at the spiritual significance of the men of Ephraim, of the Ammonites, as well as Jephthah and the Gileadites. And I had mentioned that Mr. Camping had made some excellent observations which I wanted to pass on to you and also to summarize right now, beginning with the men of Ephraim. These are a picture, a spiritual picture of those who are involved with the works of the law. This is seen, for example, in Judges 12, 2, in which they want to assist Jephthah, who typifies Christ in fighting the Ammonites. This is like the man in Judges, or excuse me, in uh, Numbers 15 that picked up sticks on the Sabbath day. That action of his, in which God said, stone the man to death, was because It symbolized adding a little bit of work to the work of Christ, which is a perfect work. And nothing can be added to the work of Christ because if that takes place, it only leads to death and destruction. The Ammonites symbolize those who are married to the law of God, which would be every single human being prior to salvation. They would be those that are still in the kingdom of Satan. Jephthah, on the other hand, represents the Messiah and the men of Gilead exemplify God's elect for whom the Savior made atonement for at the foundation of the world and like every one of God's elect, were previously unsaved and in the world. As we read, for example, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. So let's go there. Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. 
And you hath he quickened or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, before proceeding on to verse 2, I would like to review the men that followed Jephthah. They're called vain men along with the spiritual significance of the location where all of this is taking place, namely Gilead and Mizpah. At the time we were examining Judges 11.3, I was not sure who these vain men were that followed Jephthah. <clears throat> we read in Judges 11.3, let's go back there. <clears throat> then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and Tob means good. And they were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. Uh, this expression is generally translated as empty or vain, like it is here. And we have definitely run across this term before in the book of Judges, and I'll just read a couple of verses. One is Judges 7, 16, and here it is tr translated as with empty, and this has to do with Gideon and his 300 men that God had whittled down from 32,000 men, and we read about their battle strategy uh, in this verse, uh, Judges 7, 16, And he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Now, normally the pitcher during the day of salvation would be filled with water, but here the pitchers are empty empty because this is speaking about the day of judgment when salvation is no longer possible but you do have the lamps that are in the pitchers and they're going to be breaking those lamps and giving a tremendous shout and we saw where God intervened in this battle and all three of the opposing armies these are made up of the Amalekites, the Midianites, and children of the east. They began fighting against each other and basically tore each other apart. And so they didn't really even have to fight. God is the one that intervened and they just killed each other off. This also happened in Second Chronicles 20, which is another 
portrait, a similar portrait having to do with, again, the time of the end and the battle between the kingdom of Satan and the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we go to Judges 9, 4, here it says, and this has to do with Abimelech, uh, which was uh, a son of uh, Gideon uh, and uh, uh, another woman. And it says, and they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Barit wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. I'll read verse 5. And he went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel, who was Gideon, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel was left, for he hid himself. Well, here these, we want to we keep in mind that Abimelech is a picture of Satan. And he's coming against the 70 children of Gideon minus the youngest, which is Jotham. And these men, the, these are hired killers, essentially, uh, and they are the ones that followed Abimelech. This word is also used to convey something that is worthless, as in the case of the seven, seven empty ears of corn, according to Genesis 41-27, uh, during the, when Joseph was interpreting the dream for Pharaoh. And let's go there. Genesis 41, 27. All right, let's see. And the seven thin and ill-favored kine, or cattle, that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So here the ears are empty because of this tremendous famine that had spread all over the land. Well, by contrast, this expression, vain, can also denote something extremely positive when prefaced by the negation not, as verse 47 of Deuteronomy 32, 46 to 47 explains. So let's go there, Deuteronomy 32. <clears throat> this is the song of Moses. And then in verses 46 and 47, it says, and he said unto them, this is Moses speaking, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. And of course, the right after uh, the word thing is also interesting because it's the, it's the word debar, which is primarily translated as word. And it also serves to uh, highlight uh, the Bible itself, for it is not a vain thing. Thing is debar. Well, in Genesis 31, 43 to 49, we are introduced to Gilead or Galid and Mizpah, which was the location where Jacob was... Uh, uh, 
well, I guess you could say uh, Laban finally caught up with Jacob because Jacob had left in the middle of the night with his wives and all his belongings. And so Laban, his father-in-law, was in hot pursuit. And finally they meet together and they make a covenant. So let me read Genesis 31, 43 to 49. Genesis 31, 43 to 49. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children which they have borne? Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made an heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha. But Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Galid. And Mizpah, for he said, Jehovah, watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. The idea in view is that the heap of stones was a witness, a testimony, if you will, of this covenant or vow between them. And this becomes very important in light of the events that transpired in Judges 10, 17. So let's go to Judges 10, 17. And we read there, Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. It's no wonder that they besought Jephthah for his help because here the enemy is right at their front door, so to speak. So in Judges 11, 10 through 11, we find the elders of Gilead invoking God to be a witness regarding making Jephthah, symbolizing Christ, as their head and captain. So Judges 11, 10 and 11. And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Jehovah be witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before Jehovah in Mizpah. Well, with uh, the same in the same um, uh, line of, of thinking, uh, and that is having to do with uh, vows and, and witnesses. We know that the Bible speaks about true witnesses. They also speak about false witnesses. And at various times, we recognize that God calls, for example, the heavens and the earth uh, as witnesses regarding what he is about to say. In other places, like here with, with Laban and Jacob, these stones, which are inanimate objects, served as a witness. In other cases we find like an oak tree or an altar are called upon to witness certain events. In sum, we want to bear in mind that Gilead and Mizpah 
have to do with making vows or taking an oath in the presence of God. And this becomes especially meaningful with respect to Jephthah's vow in Judges 11, 30 to 31 regarding his daughter. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto Jehovah and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be Jehovah's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. I'm sure he had no idea that his daughter would come out with dances and a timbrel celebrating his victory over the Ammonites. He must have assumed, well, maybe a sheep will come out or a chicken will come out, whatever the case might be. But yet, here his only daughter comes out. And he is brought very low, as he tells her. But yet, we see uh, in his daughter a tremendous willingness to be sacrificed. And so she, too, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she came out in, in celebration in the same way that we can think of the Lord Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And that's, it's a remarkable uh, analogy there uh, between these uh, two events. Well, with that background in mind, let's move ahead to verse 2 of Judges 12. I'll read it again. And Jephthah said unto them, unto the men of Ephraim, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And, you know, it's interesting because once again, we see the battle lines drawn between Jephthah picturing Christ and his forces against the Ammonites or those who are married to the law of God. And what is it that the Ammonites want to do? They want to inherit the land of Canaan, which is a picture of the kingdom of God. And so we see this great strife that is in view and we also want to remember that the Ammonites, along with their brothers, the Moabites and the Edomites, were the same ones involved, as I mentioned earlier, in Second Chronicles 20, when they came against King Jehoshaphat and Judah historically, and they ended up killing each other as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Spiritually, we see that the men of Ephraim could not provide deliverance as they are a portrait of those who follow a gospel of works. And we have encountered this word delivered along with out of the hand repeatedly in the book of Judges as it's predominantly translated as save. It's, it's, it's the word yasha, and it's uh, very similar, or it's, I should say it's part of the Old Testament name for Jesus, or Jehoshua, or Joshua, which means Jehovah saves. And we, as I said, find this, we have found this repeatedly in the book of Judges, and I'll just read one passage, which is Judges 2, 16, in this regard. It says there, Judges 2, 16, Nevertheless, Jehovah raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoil them. This is that all too familiar cycle in the book of Judges where you have 
rebellion, there's oppression by a heathen nation, then God raises up a deliverer, and then there's a period of tranquility, and then the cycle starts all over again. Uh, another reference we can go to, and this is uh, in 1 Samuel 17, having to do with David and Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 47. <clears throat> Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of Jehovah of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will Jehovah deliver thee into mine hand. And those are the two words, deliver and into mine hand, or hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that Jehovah saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is Jehovah's, and he will give you into our hands. So again, into our hands and saveth is how these two words are used. Well, there's a couple other illustrations we can consider. Uh, one is Exodus 1430, Exodus 14.30. Thus Jehovah saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Such a tremendous deliverance as has never been seen in the history of the world. And it was so astounding and so powerful that even a number of years later, in, in an era when there, were, there was no mass communication, no telephones, no computers, no faxes, and yet uh, Rahab the harlot told the spies, we have heard about your God and what he did to the Egyptians and how they crossed over the dry land and, and all of Pharaoh's army, the greatest army in the world at that time perished in the Red Sea. We can also go to Psalm 138.7. Psalm 138.7. And there it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Well, on that most glorious note, I think we're going to have to conclude today's study as we're almost out of time. Lord willing, in our next study, we will continue our examination of chapter 12.